Hey guys, I'm gonna um, I'm gonna start in just a couple of minutes. We're waiting to see if anybody else shows up.
<laughs> Sorry, guys. You didn't hear me tell them I was going to wait a minute. <laughs> I literally answered. My <laughs> Sorry, folks. Um, I had other teachers in here. And, and also, I thought that we would have more people because I have seen Marilyn today, uh, but I have no idea where she might be. Um, I knew AJ would not be here. I don't know about Victoria. But we're going to proceed anyway because we have, uh, this is really our last discussion about Beloved. And we will test on it next week. I'm pretty confident. I, I got kind of messed up on schedule earlier. Um, Marilyn just emailed me. Um, okay, we'll figure that out. Um, I realized that I had a test in another class on Monday next week, but that's when y'all have your US history um, test, your second one. But I think everything is fine for us to have a test on Tuesday. We'll do some review on Monday um, and then the test on Tuesday. Next week is kind of, next week is like low key, but a lot of stuff do. Like you'll have your test, your Truman Show thing is due Wednesday, your podcast project is due Friday. So it is a lot of work, but not necessarily all in class work. Um, okay, so let's talk about the last section of Beloved and I'll just tell everybody else that they should go back and watch this um, Zoom after I post it. But I'm gonna talk for just a few minutes and then we're gonna watch a crash course about it, which is really helpful. So where we left off last week, um, we saw that Beloved and Denver and Seth were kind of living in this little bubble together. Um, that started out really nice and pleasant, but as time went on, it got more creepy, more vengeful, and Beloved got more creepy and vengeful, and she also started getting big, and it said she looked like she was pregnant, but she wasn't pregnant. Um, there was definitely like that question of whether she was or not, because um, we know that she did do the deed with Paul D., um, and I'll come back to that uh, in a little bit, but it says that she wasn't really pregnant with a baby. It was more like she was pregnant with life and that she was kind of sucking the life out of Setha. Setha was like giving up food for her. She was giving up time. She quit her job or she got fired from her job, I think. Um, and Beloved is just taking up all of her energy. She's like an energy vampire and she gets big and pregnant with her mom's energy. Um, and she kind of goes from just strange to sort of vengeful. And whereas Setha before was like, oh, thank God she's not mad at me for having murdered her when she was a baby. Um, she kind of is. And she definitely blames everything on Setha and says that like, you know, we saw in the stream of consciousness part where she was talking about the dead men lying on top of her and the men with no faces. Um, you know, harming her and the others. And none of that, whatever that was, none of it would have happened if Setha hadn't killed her. So she she does hold it against her. But the crazy thing is that Setha doesn't really want forgiveness. She knows that what she did was irredeemable, basically. Um, but she's hoping that they can come to some kind of understanding that like Beloved could at least understand why she did what she did. And like on one hand, she's sorry because she's grieved for her baby her whole life. And also because she, now that she's back, she wants her to know she's very sorry, but she also did what she did to protect Beloved and to prevent her from having the kind of life that Setha had at Sweet Home with school teacher. Um, so she's hoping they can come up to some sort of like truce and that never really happens. Um, we learn a lot more about Denver or Denver kind of becomes more of a main character. She's kind of been like a secondary character throughout most of it, but she comes more to the forefront and becomes what I would say was the most dynamic character um, in the book. She, and by that, I mean, she undergoes the biggest change from this petulant little girl in the beginning who is like very attached to this ghost baby and hates Paul D because he got rid of the ghost baby 
she has really become more of an adult and she wa she always was like 18 19 years old so technically she's an adult I, but um she takes it upon herself to go out and get a job because she sees the way that her household is falling mm -hmm. apart the way that setha is literally having the life leached from her and beloved is just taking advantage of her left right center and she's like all right this is not gonna stand i'm gonna go out and get a job which if you'll remember from i i see that <laughs> sorry jordan gars is in the hall um <laughs> um sorry he distracted me she um she sees that she has to provide for her family somebody has to provide for her family um because setha can't do it anymore she's choosing not to do it and beloved is weird and childlike and would be super weird if she got a job um but you know we we knew from the beginning there's kind of this separation between setha and denver and the rest of the community they they sort of look down on them mostly because of the way that setha handled herself after she killed beloved like she was proud of it she was like looking down her nose at everyone else and they didn't like that so there's been this boundary between them but now denver has gone out into the community um she needs to find work she can't stand seeing the way that her mother is suffering anymore and so she hi, she doesn't immediately find a job but what she finds is friends which is something she's never really had and all these people in the community particularly women who are willing and ready to help her they see this i mean she's 19 or so but she's still a kid and they see this kid in need and they they really band together and eventually they're sort of what drives out beloved and paul d drove out the ghost baby the first time but beloved and we'll talk more about this in just a minute but she just kind of disappears and she disappears after all these women kind of like banded together outside of their home and like chanted or sang or something like it's kind of vague what they did but i think you you can kind of see that as like a form of group prayer or um even this is kind of an extreme word but like an exorcism like trying to drive out whatever force beloved is and we find out later that like they don't even really refer to her as a woman or a person they call her like it like she's pennywise or something um and the interesting thing is that um bodwin who mr and mrs bodwin are like the best white people in the book um they live in the town and they support abolition and they pay their black employees which is not very common um, so everybody likes them but bodwin comes up to the house and setha is doing something outside and she's got an ice pick and it's almost like a a reverse of the scene with the misery where she kills beloved when school teacher drove up to her house and she killed um beloved this is kind of a, a reversal of that or like the other side of the coin where this other white man is coming up to the house and her immediate instinct is like get him with the ice pick but denver actually wrestles her to the ground and won't allow her to hurt him but the reason like bodwin obviously didn't do anything to her that would cause her to want to kill him but I think her mind just kind of went back to that time and is trying to sort of right the wrong that she committed before. Um, whereas before she killed the kid to protect her from the white man school teacher. Now she's trying to actually just kill the source of the evil, which is the white man. Problem is it's the wrong white man. Um, but they she she obviously doesn't um she doesn't succeed and the thing about it being mr bodwin is that when she killed beloved all those years ago um what's going on oh sorry <laughs> it only works like half the time if that um the thing about it being bodwin is that when when she killed beloved back in the day bodwin was kind of the one who kept her from hanging he saved her life um and now when denver wrestles her mom to the ground denver kind of saves everybody's life is she saves bodwin from being killed if setha had killed bodwin she'd have gone to prison um 
So she kind of, or maybe even been killed. Um, and so she saves her mom's life as well. Um, and speaking of Denver, Paul D does come back in the end and he kind of sees that Denver is different now. She's grown up. She doesn't seem to hate him anymore, which is obviously a huge difference. And the fact that she sort of saves them all really uh, increases her in his estimation. Um, so again, just like reiterating that Beloved kind of became this entity. Like they didn't even really think of her. They referred to Beloved as it, like when it was here, when it left, like it wasn't a human. Um, and Paul D at one point asked Denver, did you actually believe that that was your sister? And she said, sometimes I did. Um, so it's really left open um, to interpretation. And what I think what adds to that even is that after she disappears, just suddenly, um, there are all these rumors of what happened to her or it. Um, like some little boy is talking about how he saw a naked woman in the woods with fish for hair and like maybe it was her. Um, but I talked about this a little bit in the beginning when we first started talking about this book, but this is a really good example of magical realism, which is the genre of book this is. Um, and it's hard to achieve really good magical realism. Like I think it, um, it can easily turn more into fantasy, but the point of magical realism is like, first and foremost, it's realism. It, it tells life as it was, as nitty gritty as dirty as horrific as it might be and I think we've definitely gotten that down in Beloved uh, but there's also this element of magic or supernatural or something that you can't quite explain and I think there's a lot of that in this book um, and like I said it can stray too much into fantasy but I think that it's a really good job they do a really good job with it um, or Toni Morrison does a really good job with it um, so one of the big questions is whose story is this? It's called Beloved. Obviously, it kind of starts with her, uh, with the ghost baby being expelled from the house, and it ends with her disappearance, or shortly thereafter. So it does, she's got this arc, but is it really her story? I feel like on the surface, maybe it's Seth's story, because the whole thing is about their relationship, and we hear more about Setha's life before and what led her to make the decisions that she did make but then in a way it's Denver's story too she starts out the book really um petulant and um young and immature and she really grows and develops into uh, a real person uh with kind of a mind of her own despite all these horrible things that have happened to her um horrible and sort of unexplainable but then also it's kind of Paul D's story because, you know, he starts out like the, the book starts with him coming to town and it ends with him coming back. He's got this whole arc and we do find out also a lot about what he's been through and his relationship with Setha. And even though this whole book, except for the stream of consciousness part is pretty much in third person there are times when they're telling it from Paul D's perspective where it feels like it's first person, even though it's not. It's very personal, very much from his perspective. Uh, and it kind of makes me think of that scene. I think it was like the first place that we read to uh, the first week that we had this book, which was when they were coming back from the carnival and they saw their shadows intertwined like they were holding hands. And it was like, they could be a family before Beloved showed up and ruined everything. And so in a way, I think it is about the three of them. Um, I'm gonna pull my book open because I know I'm gonna wanna quote something in just a minute. Um, yeah, we're still good on time. Uh, beloved, there we go. Um, so he comes back um, and, and feels like there's a sense of relief here now. Um, you know, he felt so much tension before, like as soon as he walked into the house, it was like there was something evil and sad there. And he doesn't feel that anymore. It's very much, um, there's like a sense of relief there. Um, I'm just kind of looking through the book a little bit. That's where it's talking about. Blah, 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 blah.
it, it shifts into present tense at the end too, which is very strange. Um, but I did want to point out this book might seem like an odd choice for AP because we have like pretty much focused on nonfiction literature and um, that's really the, the point is to, is to analyze more nonfiction literature. But I feel like this is a really good book, a really good novel for it because it does experiment so much with structure and with diction. It's got stream of consciousness. It's got shifts in uh, intense, shifts in point of view as all these things that like structurally and mechanically and rhetorically are all very interesting and significant. So I think it is a really good, um, a good novel to do with this class. Um, so when Paul D comes back, Seth has pretty much like resigned herself to dying at this point because now that Beloved's gone, she feels like she sort of doesn't have anything else to live for, which like, what about Denver? <laughs> but she sort of resigned herself to death and Paul D's like, nope, I'm gonna take care of you. Um, I'm gonna, you know, you've always done everything for everybody else. I'm gonna, I'm gonna take care of you and get you well. Um, and she kind of recognizes what he, what she loved in him. And, you know, she had said something earlier on about how he was, he was like a sensitive man. He was the kind of man that made, uh, made it okay for women to cry around him. Like it was okay for women to feel vulnerable around him, which I like, that's a really nice thing to say about somebody actually. Um, and he's sort of trying to fig figure out how he feels about her. Um, but there are two things that he says that I think are really significant and beautiful, maybe three things. Um, he says that she never made him feel like he was less than a man. And we know that Paul D has struggled with his masculinity the whole time. Um, and like, what did it mean that Garner called them men? Did he really feel like he lived, like he lived up to that? Um, and oftentimes he didn't, but with Setha, he did. She never made him feel like he was less than a man. Um, and he was trying to, I am gonna quote this book. Um, she's, Setha is like freaking out about how Beloved left and she, he, she keeps saying she was my best thing and he's trying to comfort her. And he says, there are too many things to feel about this woman. This is one of my favorite quotes in any book ever, literally. His head hurts. Suddenly he remembers Sixo trying to describe what he felt about the 30 mile woman. And this is what he says, quoting Sixo. She is a friend of my mind. She gather me, man. The pieces I am, she gather them and give them back to me in all the right order. It's good, you know, when you got a woman who is a friend of your mind. And now that he is ruminating on how he feels about Setha, he's like, that's what he meant. Like, that always stuck with me that he said it that way. And... I didn't quite get it before, but with Setha, I get it. She is a friend of my mind. Um, and then he says something to her that like, I, I feel like is such a fitting and lovely end to the narrative part. There's like sort of a little epilogue, but she's, you know, devastated that Beloved has left her and she keeps saying she was my best thing. And he says, Setha, me and you, we got more yesterday than anybody. We need some kind of tomorrow, meaning like we can't dwell in the past. We have to, we have to push on and move forward. Um, and he says, you, your best thing, Setha, you are. And that's how it ends is with her saying me, me. Like nobody else has ever made her believe that she is valuable and that her life counts as much as anyone else. And that just the person she has become is enough um, and so that's, that's really lovely. And he, he also says um, he wants to put his story next to hers, which is another way of sort of validating her. Like he recognizes that her life is intrinsically separate from his and she's got her own life. She's got her own mind. She's got her own strength and weaknesses. She's got her own story. And he has all those things too. But if they can just exist side by side, that'll be enough for him. He doesn't need to control her. He doesn't need to take over her life. He just wants to coexist. I think that's really lovely. Um, so the epilogue, uh, before we get to watching this um, crash course, the epilogue starts by saying, this is not a story to pass on. And it repeats that several times throughout the, the epilogue. It was not a story to pass on. This is not a story to pass on. 
Um, and I think that means one of a couple of things that's kind of ironic because literally it's published into a book and of course it's passed on. Um, but I think you can kind of look at it two ways, which is that we're looking at the story of what happened with Beloved. And it talks about how she was sort of forgotten after that, um, after she disappeared. It says, everybody knew what she was called, but nobody anywhere knew her name. Disremembered and unaccounted for, she cannot be lost because no one is looking for her. And even if they were, how can they call her if they don't know her name? Although she has claimed, she is not claimed. In the place where long grass opens, the girl who waited to be loved and cries shame erupts into her separate parts to make it easy for the chewing laughter to swallow her all the way. Um, and then it says all these things about like, they forgot her like a bad dream, remembering seemed unwise. Um, so they forgot her like an unpleasant dream during a troubling sleep. So in one way, they they can't pass on the story because they've forgotten her. And I think that it's so poignant that part where they mentioned that she, they don't even know her name because beloved wasn't her name. That was just what was written on the gravestone. We have no idea what that person's name was or what the baby's name was. Um, so they have forgotten her. And it's also so tragic that you wouldn't want to pass it on. But then there's this other, um, this other part where we've seen this parallel between what happened to Beloved and all these slaves who died on the slave ships coming over on the Middle Passage. Uh, we've seen that repeatedly throughout the book. It's kind of a motif. And again, it's something that's not totally explainable. Um, it's just part of that magical realism. It's totally, it's open to, it, to our interpretation. Um, but I think this is kind of a tribute to those slaves. I mean, we know that it's dedicated to them. The book is dedicated to them, 60 million or more. Um, but we don't know their stories, so we can't pass them on. Um, but I think it's also kind of meant to say like, all these horrific things that happen in this book, um, despite the fact that some of them have a slight supernatural slant to them, all of these things are pretty realistic as far as the actual horrors of slavery. And by saying this is not a story to pass on, Toni Morrison's kind of calling for that kind of action to end here. Like, let's not continue that story. Let's, let's try to put that kind of behavior in the past. Um, so it works on multiple levels. Okay, so I'm done talking about it. Um, but I am going to pull up our crash course, which we have plenty of time for, lovely, uh, which is called Slavery, Ghosts, and Beloved, Crash Course Literature 214. So I'm going to share my screen with you. And this is about 11 and a half minutes. He's very uh, articulate and good, so he'll definitely have some good things to say. Hi, I'm John Green. This is Crash Course Literature, and today we're going to talk about Beloved. Mr. Green, Mr. Green, I, I actually like this book. Yeah, I know you do, me from the past, because I'm you. So you read Song of Solomon in class the year that Toni Morrison won the Nobel Prize, and that summer you read Beloved, the first, like, proper good book that you ever read for fun. Although in the case of Beloved, I suppose one uses the term fun loosely. So Morrison says in a foreword to the novel, I wanted the reader to be kidnapped, thrown ruthlessly into an alien environment as the first step into a shared experience with the book's population. And that worked for you, me, from the past. You were scared and upset and also suddenly turned on to the idea that good novels were not just hurdles that you had to jump over in order to get a high school diploma. Good books could also be like ways into better understanding of the lives of others and history and race and consciousness and what the real difference is between those who walk on two legs and those who walk on four. Yeah, I don't know. It was pretty good. It wasn't that good. Oh, you're ruining it, me, from the past. We were having a moment there. It's just kind of confusing. Like, I couldn't figure out, like, if Beloved is a real ghost or not. Oh, uh, you just have this special gift for asking the least interesting possible question about everything we read. If you take a hard line on the question of Beloved's quote-unquote realness, or even spend too much time thinking about it, you're missing the point. I mean, there are clues in the book that speak to each perspective, some that suggest that Beloved is the ghost returned in human form, and others hinting that she is a woman who has recently escaped sexual 
slavery and exploitation who happens to just call herself beloved. We're not supposed to know definitively whether beloved is really real. I mean, isn't that the nature of ghosts? And it is her ghostliness that makes her such a brilliant embodiment of all those disremembered and unaccounted for. Ultimately, beloved is a symbol for the 60 million and more lost in slavery whose stories and names we will never know. <laughs> So critics often call good novels like beautiful and haunting, but beloved, both the character and the novel, are actually haunting. For me, at least when I'm reading this novel, my pulse begins to quicken as I feel the presence of unsettled, wronged souls beneath and around me. I mean, there are so many untold fates and stories in this novel, right? There's the 14-year-old boy who lives alone in the woods and never remembers living anywhere else. There are the other Pauls, the men on Paul D's chain gang, Setha's mother, Hallie. Beloved embodies the disremembered that is woven into life and art in the United States. I mean, Morrison's story is fiction. It's full of improbabilities and ghosts, but it's also one of the most powerfully convincing depictions of slavery I've ever read. Because in the process of what Setha and Paul call rememory, we're confronted with the reality of what love looks like in a world of twisted conscience. And we're finally left with the unassailable resiliency of human beings to continue in the face of all attempts to dehumanize them. Definitions belonged to the definers, not not the defined, we read in Beloved, but in a world where slaves were defined as inhuman, I mean, in this story, they're compared to hogs and cattle and horses. They find ways to humanness anyway. And that is what made slavery untenable. Not Abraham Lincoln, not Harriet Beecher Stowe, but slaves themselves, unnamed and unknown, who resisted and persevered, and therein lies the hope in this very very sad novel. So let's start with mothers. The mother-child relationship is mythologized as like the most important among humans and most other animals. But in the context of slavery, as Morrison writes, unless carefree, mother love is a killer. And that is not meant figuratively. So the central character of Beloved is Setha, and she was raised basically motherless in a system of slavery that intentionally disrupted mother-child relationships. Like baby Setha is fed by another woman's milk, for instance, which is one of the reasons that having her own milk stolen by the white men who abuse her is so horrifying to her. Children were often sold separately from their mothers, marriages were not recognized, and in the era of the Fugitive Slave Act, even in freedom, Setha's children were still claimable property. And when your children literally do not belong to you, what does it mean to be a mom? Setha's main mentor for mothering is her mother-in-law, Baby Suggs, but her life has also been profoundly disrupted by slavery's breaking of family. In all of Baby's life, as well as Setha's own, men and women were moved around like checkers. Anybody Baby Suggs knew, let alone loved, who hadn't run off or been hanged, got rented out, loaned out, bought up, brought back, stored up, more mortgaged, won, stolen, or seized. So Baby's eight children had six fathers. What she called the nastiness of life was the shock she received upon learning that nobody stopped playing checkers just because the pieces included her children. So Setha stands in this disrupted line, but she tries to resist by holding on to her family. She gets all her children across the Ohio River to freedom from the slave farm sweet home where they were born, and she carries one in her womb on swollen feet to freedom. But when the slave owner comes to Ohio 28 days later to claim them, she takes them out back to the woodshed to kill them all before he can take them. She only manages to kill one, sawing through its neck. If I hadn't killed her, she says, she would have died. When explaining this to the beloved who has wandered into her life in the flesh, she goes deeper into what she did and the intergenerational destruction that slavery put upon the mother line. My plan was to take us all to the other side, where my own man is. They stopped me from getting us there, but they didn't stop you from getting here. You came right on back like a good girl, like a daughter, which is what I wanted to be and would have been if my mam had been able to get out of the rice long enough before they hanged her and let me be one. Setha never got the chance to be a daughter, but she does get to be a mother, and the intensity of her mother love is incomprehensible to everyone else. To her remaining daughter, Denver, to her lover, Paul D, to her entire community who ostracizes her, your love is too thick. Paul D says to her. He feels that she didn't have the right to decide her children's future, to deny them a future. He thinks her inhuman. You got two feet, Setha. 
not four. But what does it mean to have two feet in a system aimed at breaking families and individuals apart, especially women who were not meant to be mothers and daughters, but cattle and calves? This is made very explicit early in the novel when it said that sex with a slave woman was not for Hallie so different from sex with a calf. To be a mother and to allow her daughters to be daughters, Setha has to escape the system itself. First, for her, this means escape to the north, and then, when that fails, it means escape to the other side. As Setha responds to Paul D's accusation of too thick love, love is or it ain't. Thin love ain't love at all. So what ultimately is the truly human response to this oppression? What is the proper response of the two-footed creature? Okay, let's go to the thought bubble. So when Beloved begins, Setha and Denver's house is haunted by the ghost of the dead baby. And then Paul D, who lived with Setha at Sweet Home, arrives and in short order begins a relationship with Setha, rids the house of the ghost, and takes Denver and Setha to a carnival. And then the adult Beloved wanders into their house 18 years after the already crawling baby was killed. We slowly learn of Paul D's past, including his horrifying time being abused in every way imaginable on a chain gang, and of Setha and Denver Denver's isolated life in the house they share, while Beloved consumes more and more of Setha's life. After Paldi finds out that Setha killed her baby, the Setha-Beloved-Denver dynamic goes from somewhat weird to truly terrifying. They consume each other and each other's stories, and as Beloved grows larger, Setha grows ever smaller. Even Denver is eventually locked out from Beloved and Setha's mutual obsession. The novel moves among many perspectives, third person, close in on baby subs, or Denver, or Paul D, or Setha, and then in moments, first person, from various perspectives. And it also changes tense from past to present, as if the past isn't really past, especially to the women in the novel. They cannot lock it away and move on. Setha's attempt to kill herself and her family saves them all from a return to slavery, but she can't escape it. As Toni Morrison later said in an interview about Beloved, you can't let the past strangle you if you're going to go forward. But nevertheless, the past is not going anywhere. Thanks, Thought Bubble. So Beloved ends on a somewhat hopeful note. I mean, there's an attempted murder. But in the context of Beloved, that's actually fairly hopeful. Denver begins to care for herself, and she sees clearly both the value of holding on to the mother line and the danger of holding on to trauma. And then there's Paul D, who once had less freedom than a rooster called Mister, who's seen rape and death and dehumanization, who, along with his fellow slaves, has been made to feel like, quote, trespassers among the human race, watchdogs without teeth, steer bulls without horns, gelded workhorses whose neigh and whinny could not be translated in a language responsible humans spoke. Paul D. believed that to survive such a world, you protected yourself and loved small. He picked the tiniest stars out of the sky to own a woman, a child, a brother, he thinks. A big love like that would split you wide open. Anything could stir him, we read, and he tried hard not to love it. But Setha helps him to see it's two that o'clock. to Thank get you. to a place where you could love anything you chose, not to need permission for desire, well, now that was freedom. And he, in return, encourages Setha to imagine a future, saying to her near the end of the novel, me and you, we got more yesterday than anybody. We need some kind of tomorrow. So in the end, Denver has learned to stand on her own two feet, and Beloved has moved on only after the entire community has come to Setha to forgive her. And Paul D. opens himself up to big love, to thick love, to the love of Setha, because, quote, he wants to put his story next to hers. And in his love, he describes what all the characters, who all love each other in their own ways, do for each other. He says, she is a friend of my mind. She gather me, man. The pieces I am, she gather them and give them back to me in all the right order. The novel itself is a dialogue with the American idea of itself and with the original American sin of slavery. And it tells us something about how to walk on two feet, not four. And yes, like any horror novel, it is revolting. It's revolting because we are forced to look at ourselves as we have been and as we still are in many ways. We've seen this from Oedipus to Slaughterhouse Five. Great books can show us the ways that man can be a wolf to man. But they also show us something of how to go on and why. Morrison's genius here is in taking the tragedy of slavery and giving it shape for us to deal with it. So often horrors feel overwhelming to us and formless, and that can make them unfathomable. Near the end of the book, Morrison writes, disremembered and unaccounted for, she cannot be lost because no one is looking for her. And even if they were, how can they call her if they don't know her name? But now we do have at least one name, Beloved. Thanks for watching. I'll see you next week. Crash Course is made with El-
All right. But he had some good things to say there. All right, so it's a, it's 201 already. I'm not gonna start anything new right now, um, but we will do some review for the test on Monday um, and we will have the test on Tuesday. Um, obviously you'll, uh, if you don't finish it and you should in the, in the given time, but if you don't finish it, you can stay Wednesday and turn it in. Uh, but also your Truman Show paper is due on Wednesday as well. All right. I hope everyone has a great weekend and I will see y'all next week.